two people on on our question list. I'm going to start with uh, Calvin Wu says, thank you for the presentations. My question is for John. Did the early Soviet work of Bukharin et al. on Marxist education ecology make any headway or impact in Britain. I'm wondering whether J.D. Bernal or J.B.S. Haldane has also contributed, have also contributed to Marxist ecology. And then the second question I invite, oh, the second question I invite Joe Ramsey to unmute himself and to read it out loud word for word. Okay, thank you, Kira. Thanks everyone for your present. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, let's see. So I wrote in the chat box that I would like to hear Marcelo share a sample of a formulation or two uh, as to how Marx himself expressed the idea of communism um, in some of these lesser known works and perhaps highlighting what seems significantly different from some of the, in my view, quite inspiring formulations we already have, however inadequate they might be. Uh, or in, such as from each according to ability to each according to need, a society where the free development of each is, is uh, the condition for the free development of all. Uh, and I'd also welcome John Bellamy Foster to speak to how ecology may uh, intersect with those notions of communism. Thank you. All right, let's start off with those two questions and then we'll go to the next one. John, would you like to take it away? Okay, well, the the first question on um, the influence of the early Soviet ecologists on on Marxists in in Britain. Th this is uh, something that I I dealt with at great length as part of my book, The Return of Nature. So um, the answer the answer can be found there in in great detail, but. Um, Basically, uh, it was in 1931, there was a, uh, 1931, there was a second international conference on the history of science and technology in London. And they had uh, invited a, a Soviet participant to that conference. And um, uh, Stevan Chinsky, and, um, but it, they didn't think anybody was gonna come from the Soviet Union. The, in fact, Stalin was prohibiting it until the last moment. And, uh, but uh, while well, the conference was, was starting and, or it was the day before, it was, it was just beginning and, the, and uh, a plane arrived from the Soviet Union and landed in London, which was intercontinental flights were very rare then. And out came Nikolai Bukharin and Steveninsky and uh, Vavilov and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, um, Boris Hessen, a lot of the e leading ecological scientists uh, in in uh, the Soviet Union. And um, so they, the uh, the British scientists like um, uh, like Need Joseph Needham and JBS Haldane and JD Burnell and and others were all involved in this conference and they connected with the Russian visitors and they quickly translated everything like overnight. They even they even manufactured a book in like in like two or three days and they the um and they had these Russian presentations and it threw the um the the uh, British socialist scientists um, it it bowled them over. Uh, they 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 had a new viewpoint uh, and uh, really an, an ecological viewpoint, a more dialectical viewpoint on science and and uh, um, a a new history and sociology of science provided by Boris Hessen. And uh, it's out of out of this that. Um, the British Marxist um, ecological tradition developed really. It's it's under the influence of these thinkers, who then they went back to the um, the Soviet Union, and uh, they were almost all executed um, within a few years. So um, the um, but in Britain, they carried on in that tradition. And it was quite distinct from what was going on in the Soviet Union itself, although they had connections there, but they were developing um, a genuine 
um, exploration of dialectical materialism and nature. Um, and this is being carried out by some of the, the, the leading scientists in, in Britain. And they developed all sorts of ecological views. So yeah, their influence was there. And I think that, that, that in Britain, you had this sort of second foundation of Marxism, which then carried over to scientists in the United States and um, still is important. Um, and remember in the 1970s, as I said, there was, it, was, um, it, was under, it was sort of taken for granted that Marxism was ecological. It was only in the 1980s that turned around. I mean, when, when E.P. Thompson gave his great speech uh, on the notes on exterminism, his great um, um, pronouncement on that, he, he said, you know, the, the answer was, was, was um, the ecological imperative. That's what would guide the resistance. That was common at the time in 1980, but by the late 1980s, it, um, it came to be um, the view that Marxism had always been opposed to ecology and Promethean, which um, contradicted all of this. And of course, the contributions of the scientists had been forgotten because Marxism had declared that it had nothing to do with science. And um, or uh, many of um, the, if you look at um, a, a figure like Perry Anderson said that Marxism really had never had anything to do with natural science, which wasn't wasn't true, wasn't accurate, but but people believed it and they stopped looking. So yeah, there was this tradition in Britain. It had its faults, uh, it had its contradictions but it's uh, very, very important in terms of understanding both the development of ecology and, and um, our own practice today. I would like to go back to the um, question asked by, by Joe Ramsey and um, read a couple of quotations first and then try to answer to what is the difference, what is the main difference. Um, let me first start by saying that um, the quotation, the passages, let's say the definition of communist by Marx that I will read are all related to um, his um, um, writings written uh, when he had already studied for a long time the critique of political economy. And I will be uh, clearer uh, uh, later. So when we read Capital, for me, the most essential uh, quotation is that communism is an association of free individuals working with the means of production held in common and expanding their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as one single social labor force. But these quotations are um, even um, you know, expanded in the preparatory manuscript, for example, the one published between 63 and 67, when Marx spoke of the passages from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor. And in the critique of the Coda program, there is a connection with that later, he defined the social organization based on common ownership of the means of production as a cooperative society. So in this manuscript, what do we find? We find a more detailed explanation of what Marx wrote very quickly, uh, sometimes in a couple of words or a couple of lines in Capital, when Marx is talking about the fact that the, the ruling principle of the agri formal society will be the full and free development of free individual, as I mentioned before. This is something that we can find in many uh, places. And in my uh, chapter, there is a, a long list to this. For me, the main difference uh, um, between this and the texts that I read or the Communist Manifesto is the fact that Marx provided these definitions and this analysis when he had a deeper understanding of socioeconomic analysis, when Marx had a deeper understanding of capitalism, and also when Marx had done at the end of his life, more political experience as a, as a leader of the international or just observing um, the Paris Commune at very late, um, the Russian populist movement in, in Russia. And if I can anticipate something that is asked by uh, Babak Amini in the chat, and I'm, I guess that uh, John Bellamy Foster will respond to this, but the question about the associate mode of production, if the associate mode of production is an ecological mode of production, 
then Kira will read the the uh, question uh, in a in a in a better way. I just want to anticipate this. I think it is there is a lot related to planned economy. So perhaps the ecological element can be taken also from that point of view and to the fact that that society is not a society that leaves everything to the market, to the um, um, presupposed self-regulation of the market, then in the end, as we see, destroy the society, not only socially, but also ecologically. So that's uh, all for me for now. All right, thank you very much. Despite the interruptions in the chat, we actually have four more questions to pose to the speakers. I'd like to start off with first a question from one of our co-producers, Sren Mudliar, who says, if we posit that Marx was not a Promethean thinker, what are the standards by which he would, be, would have been measured, leaving the earth better, cited by Marcello, for successive generations? Uh, this question is posed to both John and Marcello. And then the second question comes from Babaka Mini. Would Marx's conception of communism as an associated mode of production be logically ecological? Is there a necessary logical link between Marx's conception of communism and his ecological understanding? In other words, is an, is, quote, associated mode of production, end quote, one and the same as an ecological associated mode of production? And I believe this is uh, directed at both speakers. Well, I can, you, right? yeah. shall I answer the first one? The, the, um, if we, the question is, if we posit um, that Marx wasn't a Promethean thinker, um, what are we, you know, what measure uh, do we take him by? Uh, the, um, well, the, the, the whole, the Prom Promethean terminology uh, the the notion of uh, somebody being a Promethean thinker was largely introduced to attack Marx and no other thinker. Basically, only Marx was was characterized as Promethean, and it's very important. And, and it seemed to it seemed to fit because everybody's seen the pictures of Marx depicted in his early days as Prometheus. And of course, when he wrote his doctoral dissertation, he had praised uh, Prome he had praised Epicurus as as um, a Promethean figure, and he praised Prometheus um, based on Aeschylus's play, where um, where Prometheus was actually a revolutionary figure. What there 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 were two um, traditions in terms of the the notion of Promethean of of Prometheus and Promethean. Up through, up until the 19th century, almost all references to Prometheus had to do with, with the uh, being the giver of light. And from that came the notion of enlightenment, which uh, the um, Voltaire introduced, but he really took it from Lucretius, um, Epicurus's follower, Lucretius. And, Epicurus and Lucretius were often seen as Marx. Marx called Epicurus the Enlightenment figure of of um, of um, antiquity, and in the German ideology. And uh, Epicurus was seen as a figure who combated religion and provided a materialist view. And so he was associated with the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment Enlightenment meant bringing light. It meant bringing um, wisdom and uh, uh, the, it's a metaphor uh, for that. But in the 19th century, the metaphor got changed. I mean, there, the metaphor got changed. Uh, I mean, you can see it all through the 18th century. It all means one thing. In 19th century, the earliest that I know of is, is, um, is Mary Shelley and, and Prudhomme um, started to use Promethean to mean machinery to mean mechanism, to mean industrialism. And uh, that's what it's come to mean today, but it's completely removed from what Marx was referring to when he referred to Prometheus. So this got all very confused. And uh, there was attacks on Marx for being Promethean 
and uh, by which it was meant that he was an advocate of extreme industrialism as the object of society. And those who made that charge never really could provide any evidence of it. Um, I mean, obviously Marx believed in industrial development, so did everyone else in the 19th century. Even, even the romantic poets, they believed in it to some extent, but Marx never believed in, in um, mechanism or industrialism as the, the object of society. He even, he even uh, in the poverty of philosophy, he even criticizes Proudhon for that. So um, it, it was a charge and it was particularly, uh, Ted Benton made it quite, famous in his Marxism and Natural Limits, that Marx was Promethean and, and people swallowed that. And so we went, systematically went through, there's just no evidence of, of that whatsoever. And, and there's evidence of Marx having a deep ecological view. Where does ecology come from? Uh, where it, it came from a materialist understanding of nature in the first place. Uh, is very, uh, and um, in, and Marx, um, Marx picked that up, and uh, he uh, he adopted the concept of of um, metabolism, for example, which is still the basis of our ecological perspective. We talk about the Earth metabolism, right, in order to understand the car um, the the uh, climate problem. We talk about the carbon metabolism. It's all based on the same systems uh, perspective. So Marx. Um, um, Marx had a, a really deep ecological view. Um, the word ecology was not used in his day. Um, it's too true, Heckel coined it, but it wasn't really used until the 20th century. But they did use the, the notion of, of um, metabolism and, and Marx was the leader in introducing that into the social realm. Uh, so there's, um, it's, it's a profound ecological think. Um, I don't know what we would say he's measured by. Um, I think um, I think it's enough to say that this is is uh, a dialectic that involves both the materialist conception of nature and the materialist conception of history. So it's fundamentally ecological in the substantive sense. And uh, there's a, a lot of uh, literature on this. There are people who have carried the uh, gone into it um, in depth. Besides my own work, there's people like Koei Saito, there's people like Ian Angus, who's um, used this analysis to deal with uh, the problem of the Anthropocene and the climate problem. Uh, there's just um, innumerable people have building on this. So I guess if I wanted to, to um, give a label to it, I would say it's Marxist. Thank you, John. Marcello, do you want to take the second half? No, I'm fine with everything that John said, and there is not very much to add. And the second question was about um, the one of Baba Kamini, right? Was about the um, associated mode of production. And I tried to respond already before in relation to what uh, Joseph Ramsey asked me. So mentioning the question of planned economy, I don't know if John wants to add anything else about this, or we can go ahead with the other questions. I, I'd like to add something. Is in Marx and his most developed definition of, of socialism in volume three of Capital says um, it, that socialism is the rational, this is very close to his words, but it's a paraphrase, um, uh, rational regulation by the associated producers of, of the metabolism between human beings and nature, so as to promote their own development while conserving energy. But this is the, he's saying, he's defining socialism as the rational regulation of the metabolism between human beings and nature and uh, by the associated producers. And of course, the metabolism between human beings and nature is production for Marx. And uh, this is, this is um, it was, as the question asked, was, was this the same? Uh, was this the, the um, associated mode of production 
the same as the ecological perspective? Yes, um, I think the answer is yes, it was. And um, there's a great article by Paul Burkett that appeared in Month Review, I forget when, I think it was like 2005, called Marx's Vision on Sustainable Human Development. And it provides a very, very coherent view of um, Marx's notion of associated mode of production and its relation to, to ecology and sustainable human development. They're all wrapped up together for Marx. All right, thank you both very much. So we have three last questions if uh, we have time for all three. I'll start first with uh, Paul Zaram Zaramka. If you'd like to unmute and read your question out loud. All right, if he's not available to read the question out loud, I'll just say um, what he wrote. Marcello, regarding your mentioning of the need to pay great attention to personal freedom, I would like to point out the current mo the current among too much of the left to support, even enthusiastically, vaccine mandates, thereby denying their uh, freedoms and ignoring in the process alternatives like early treatments against COVID-19. I wonder what your thoughts on this problem related to personal freedom are. And the next one is uh, from Peter Fay. Uh, Peter, would you like to unmute and read your question out loud? All right. After 50 years as a Marxist, I found the most reliable differentiator of leftists and revolutionaries is the interpretation of dictatorship of the proletariat. How can leftists reject Marx's words to Weidemeyer the class, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat? It still call themselves Marxists. Are we relieving Euro Marx communism? And uh, I'll throw those to Marcello first. Yes, uh, thanks, Kira. So, um, very briefly on both questions, I believe that um, one thing in the many debates that we had in the past two years uh, during the pandemic, one thing is questioning the permanent state of exception that uh, uh, many governments impose on society, and there were many debates. Uh, in Italy, in particular with Agamben, for example, that were popular um, and um, you know disseminated abroad. Another thing is advocating against vaccine and considering that, um, uh, I don't know, not doing the vaccine is an example of freedom. So I, I don't agree with the, with the, with the Tsarenka on, on this point, and I will not um, take this as a, as a, I don't know, an important, um, um, characteristic that the left should um, embrace. Um, the second question, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and there is um, a famous uh, study made, published by Mont Review um, on this uh, concept. And um, um, this indicated that Marx and Engels use both of them, the expression dictatorship of the proletariat not only in things that they publish, but in private letters, including the famous one to Weidemeyer mentioned here, written in 1852, only 12 times. On the contrary, this concept is, uh, has been widely used by uh, many uh, Marxists uh, hundreds of times, if not thousands of times in the 20th century. So I think that there is a, an uh, over-characterization of this and uh, as Hal Draper, who is the scholar that I mentioned before without mentioning your name, indicated sometimes there is also a misunderstanding of what Marx meant with this. And uh, I don't think that uh, the critique of dictatorship of the proletariat of this idea associating this to socialism means reviving Euro communism or a social democracy. Thanks. Well, in terms of the first first question, I, I don't want to get into the vaccine issue specifically. Um, uh, although I want to note that um, in the United States, we've just had we've reached uh, a million deaths this last week, 
And uh, I do think that there is a relationship between personal freedom and social freedom. The Marxist approach is, is um, focuses on social freedom, which doesn't negate individual freedom, but it has to, um, there's a dialectical relation between the two. And, um, and we have to be aware of safeguarding uh, society as a whole. So uh, it's a complex question. It, it's, um, and um, when, when does an individual action endanger um, the much larger population? So um, in, in some states in the United States where, they, where, um, where there's a protest against um, vaccination, the death, the mortality rate is much higher and, um, the, and there are a lot of innocent victims. So um, in terms of the, the second uh, question, dictatorship of the proletariat, I sometimes think that um, when, it, when it comes to, to terminology, oftentimes because Marx said something, the, the term becomes negative. It changes its meaning because of all of the, the polemics and the, 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 the Cold War propaganda and so on. Dictatorship in classical terms meant, um, meant um, a, a situation of temporary um, kind of emergency rule uh, that in, in, a in, an, you know, in a transition, an emergency, and that's what it meant in ancient Rome, and that's the sense in which they used it. But the term and the term dictatorship, its meaning changed uh, in the 20th century. It came to mean something quite different than what it had originally meant. And so we have to watch the changes in language. We have to look at, well, what did it mean when they used the term, the dictatorship of the proletariat? Everybody knows that they, they saw it, it, um, the present society was a class dictatorship of the, of the bourgeoisie. The dictatorship of the proletariat was an emergency situation though, where in a transition where the proletariat would, would um, rule the society like in the Paris Commune uh, and, um, but the object, object was to get beyond that, to get beyond any form of class rule. So if you, you understand it the way Marx and Engels wrote about it, the historical antecedents and so on, there's no problem. Uh, but the propaganda wants to um, give to um, their meaning a quite different meaning that um, is, was product of the 20th century and carries on into our own century. So um, we either look at this um, in intelligently with historical understanding or we don't. Thank you, John. Um, Marcella, do you wanna, I see you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to make a comment? No, no, no. I responded before John this time, no? Yeah. All right, then. Um, we have two more questions on the docket, and, and it seems we have just another one that's popped up. First off comes from Mauricio Vieira Martins. Uh, to Marcello, your exposition, in your exposition, you emphasize that Marx was also concerned with the freedom of different individuals. Considering this, what is your opinion on the widespread use of the concept of Marxist egalitarianism to define Marxist thinking? Does this concept do justice to the complexity of texts such as the critique of the Gotha program? And also congratulations on the initiation of this important debate. And then I'd like to invite Michael Novich to uh, unmute and ask his question. Ah, he has messaged me to say he is no long, he can no longer unmute. There he is. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I'm sorry I joined late, but uh, I'm curious if the speakers would say something about uh, Marx's uh, view about expropriation as well as exploitation in uh, defining the nature of capitalism, particularly in terms of the, the, of the question of land and rent and its uh, 
its role within capitalist economics. Thank you. Switching it up, uh, Marcello, the first question was uh, pointed to you if you'd like to take that. Yes, you also mentioned that there was a third one. Should we do all together because we are... I will admit a fourth one just came in as well. <laughs> so, um, the so third we... one comes from Babak Amini and is posted in the chat. Um, he writes, I was wondering if there were new or unique developments in Marxist thinking on ecology communism in his late years, late uh, 1870s until his death, particularly in relation to the possibility of non-linear historical developments and non-Western societies. Do we need a different, perhaps broader concept of rational planning in post-capitalism in the light of the late years of Marx? Is it all right if we stick to these three questions and we get to the, the last question in a bit? Yeah. yeah. You want to go first, John? OK, well, um, in terms of the first question on Marxist egalitarianism, I, I, I basically agree with Isvan Maseros in his Beyond Capital that the fundamental Marxist view, and this this includes Marx, obviously, but goes back even as far as Babouf, is um, is one of substantive equality. Um, the Marxism is um, not an argument for formal equality, which is the way we generally know equality, and and that and and um, formal equality has inequality built into it, um, but it's rather uh, Marxism is based on the notion of substantive equality. So in terms of, I don't, um, it goes further in terms of egalitarianism than any other um, viewpoint. And um, in fact, I often say that socialism in our time is, is really um, uh, comes down to substantive equality, the struggle for substantive equality and ecological sustainability. So um, I don't think you can go further than that. And Maseros, when he was developing the notion of substantive equality, did it um, primarily in the context of, of uh, women and Marx and Engels's writings on, on women. And it's really a, a very powerful discussion. So if you're interested in that, I would say go to that particular source, Mazeros's Beyond Capital, and read what he had to say about substantive equality and women. In terms of, um, of uh, the expropriation question, the, um, yeah, this, this has uh, been a problem for Marxist theory. People got it entranced by the notion of, of Primitive accumulation, the um, that that concept supposedly in Marx, and they got all tangled up in it. They like the term primitive accumulation, so it's used over and over again. It seems to not be noticed that Marx said over and over again, so-called primitive accumulation. He did use the term primitive accumulation, but he prefaced it. He headed the section so-called primitive accumulation. He, re he repeated that, he repeated it in, in the final chapter of Capital, he says, so-called primitive accumulation. Why did he say that? It wasn't over the word primitive. He was, he was taking the, the notion of um, his, he was involved in a critique of what Adam Smith called original stock, stock standing for accumulation. The, uh, where did the original stock come from? And the one it was, Trans, when Marx wrote Capital, uh, he was um, his, um, and it was translated back into English. It was mistranslated as instead of original or primary accumulation or so-called original or primary accumulation, it was mistranslated as primitive, which created all sorts of confusion. But what Marx was complaining about when he said so-called primitive accumulation, or where, when he said so-called original accumulation or primary accumulation, 
what, what he was complaining about was, was the notion that it was accumulation at all. The, and if you look at the text, if you look all the chapters in that section of capital, he's not taught, he, the term he uses most often, the term he, explain, he uses to explain what was going on was expropriation. The land was being expropriated from, from uh, the, um, well, the commons were being expropriated from the peasants, but it's all about expropriation expropriation of land, but it's also about expropriation of bodies because slavery and bonded labor and, uh, and uh, all of that comes into the discussion. So he's focusing on expropriation. What's that? It's robbery, right? And uh, that's really crucial. It wasn't accumulation. Accumulation is, a, well, is, um, is the, in, in the savings and investment process, as we say. Um, and uh, accumulation is what capital does. This is not what's an accumulation. It was expropriation as a basis of capital. And that's been lost. Um, that concept got lost in, in, um, in most of the treatments of, of um, what's called primitive accumulation. So it, it, um, that, that became a real problem. Now, what is expropriation? Expropriation is appropriation without an equivalent. And Marx also used the term appropriation without exchange, because for him, uh, exchange didn't occur. Um, it, appropriation, he'd say appropriation without um, exchange. Uh, it, it, well, he would use expropriation. For him, for Marx, you couldn't have unequal exchange. If it was exchange, it meant, it meant there were equivalents uh, exchanged. And uh, so he didn't use the term unequal exchange. He used notions of appropriation without exchange, expropriation without equivalent. Pauline used the term appropriation without reciprocity. And, and this is what expropriation is. And it provides the, it provides the condition on, under which exploitation can take place. But expropriation is always renewed in order to renew the conditions of exploitation. And this is something that we, we developed and understood in, in Marx's ecology. Uh, I deal with it with Brett Clark and the robbery of nature and Hannah Holloman and Brett Clark and I have written uh, about this, uh, about Marx and expropriation. Um, but but um, yeah, in the... In the um, Robbery of nature is dealt with in detail, and others like um, others have been dealing with this in terms of social reproduction theory, um, the um, bringing in um, the concept of, of expropriation, and it's also being used in uh, in the racial capitalism theory, and it's it's being it's increasingly understood. Uh, and um, you have people like uh, Peter Lindquist who, who deal with this. It's increasingly understood that um, you have to have a dialectic of, uh, you have to have, have to understand in terms of the dialectic of expropriation and exploitation, that um, they are interrelated uh, perpetually within capitalism, and that was Marx's view. I hope that that helps. I will then focus on the other questions. Kira, may I? <clears throat> and John is also having problems with the light. I hope that it yeah. works. <laughs> so, um, Maurizio, um, very interesting question. And uh, I think it is useful for me to <clears throat> cover one point that I uh, add to a minute at the beginning of my presentation. <clears throat> so to talk a little bit about this form of um, pre-Marxian socialism, uh, called utopian socialist. I don't like this expression or early socialist perhaps better. This is also good to see how significant was uh, Marx's contribution in, in his critique to, to capitalism. Usually we quote um, Babeuf, Cabe, this idea of a primordial socialism, but um, I would like to read a couple of quotations from uh, very important um, uh, people and revolutionary at the time one is uh, Theodore Desamis, 
And another one, perhaps more known as Weitling. Uh, Desami wrote uh, the community code in 1842. So this is just a, a few years before the Communist Manifesto. And I would like to read this because he spoke of a word quoting divided into commons as equal, regular, and united as possible, in which there will be a single kitchen, one common dormitory for all children children, the whole citizenry will live as a family in one single house. So there is this idea of radical equality that is also strong in the other author that I wanted to mention, uh, Weitling, Wilhelm Weitling, in the book uh, Humanity as it is and as it should be, published in 1838. So he foresaw the elimination of private property and he believed that this will automatically put an end to egoism and simplistically regarded the main in course of our social problems, I write in my book, quotations, in these eyes, the community of gods will be the means to redemption of humanity, transforming the earth into paradise and immediately bringing about enormous abundance. What is, in my opinion, the problem with this uh, ultra egalitarian primordial socialism? Well, all the thinker who projected such a vision had committed the dual error First of all, they took it from granted that the adoption of a new social model based on this strict conception of the quality, very different from the one that John has mentioned at the beginning, that this could be the solution for all the problems of the society, eat the same, dress the same, etc. And um, they convinced themselves without knowing sometimes anything at all about economic laws, that all that was necessary to achieve, it was the imposition of certain measures from um, on high, whose effect will later be altered by the course of the economy. So this idea that we impose from the top, sometimes also with the state, this strict equality, and this will be the solution for everything. Um, the other question, um, Babak, about the old Marx, I don't think that the old Marx said um, was strong enough to rethink this complicated question, or perhaps even to rethink, to, to write it down for the first time in a proper, not very fragmentary and sometimes contradictory way of planning, rational planning, etc. On the question of the non-linear historical development of Western society, of non-Western society, on the contrary, we can see some useful uh, um, uh, changes, improvement, in particular with the famous preface to the 1859 critique of the political economy when Marx is talking about his four modes of production, feudalism, Asiatic mode of production, capitalism, and socialism. So Marx is more open, right? This is what I would like to mention. Although there are some problems in some statements that we will find, that we can find in the anthropology, anthropological, ethnological notebooks, and we are very much looking forward the publication of the new editions of these documents forthcoming, edited by David Norman Smith for Yale University Press. Hopefully 2023 is out. <clears throat> but I want to mention that even there are these changes, improvement, Marx is not completely different. It's not making any turn with relation to the question of capitalism and the role that capitalism had. So Marx is not turning back into, I don't know, the critique of uh, Hertz and socialism uh, that he was making in the 50s and in the 70s. This is not a Marx like the one represented by scholars like Enrique Dussel or many people in the 70s and the 80s who talk about third world Marxism. So the idea that revolution can be done without a central role of the working class. Thanks. Thank you. Gosh, uh, we're towards the end of our program and we have one last question. Uh, I'm gonna invite Julian Zavaya to, uh, to unmute his microphone and uh, pose his question. All righty, hi. Uh, I'd first off, just like to say uh, thanks for everybody, uh, uh, Kira and Saren that put this together and all the speakers uh, that dedicated their time to this. Um, so my question, uh, I'll read it off just from what I sent. Where does China stand with respect to the progression to socialism and then communism? Is there any reason to think that there is a meaningful uh, 
meaningful uh, progression to this end in China? Should we view China as being a useful force in the world and helping to foster the development uh, of other nations, such as in Africa, as in as the USSR had done, or is this naive? Should we perhaps only see China as useful uh, so far as it threatens the hegemonic uh, dominance of the United States and uh, the West generally? Uh, just what is the what should we as Marxists uh, see uh, China as uh, in today? Uh, Marcello, do you want to take a step at this question? John, first as always, or you know, I can go very quickly if you want, and then I'll leave to John the final things. So <clears throat> I will go for the second option. I don't think that China represents what um, it was um, for some in the past, like a useful force for socialism. I see that the Chinese Communist Party reading the documents and reading also um, what their policy is, uh, can be seen from many point of view more like a nationalist force than, than, than a socialist force. So I will not uh, be inclined to, to have this um, um, reading of, uh, of China and of uh, the experience of China's socialism today in the 21st century. Well, my view is a little bit more complicated, I think, because um, I think that uh, China is uh, a post-revolutionary society. I don't think uh, it's um, it's socialist or capitalist, and according to our traditional definitions, it's um, it's a society that. Um, is um, still in conflict and undetermined. It has elements that uh, are socialist and elements that are capitalist, and um, and there there are there are uh, really serious um, battles going on in China in terms of determining its future. In terms of revolutions, we can't we can't. Um, expect them to always develop as, as we would like. And um, we have to examine the historical process. So I think, um, I think there are actually some amazing things that are happening in China now that it's, um, that it's going in what we could call a more socialist direction. Certainly it's, and uh, it's, um, it's got its national project as um, Marcello said, but I, um, you know, it's it's still indeterminate. Um, I am I am sympathetic with those in China who um, want to promote socialism and revolution, and that we would consider on the left. And um, I'm not sympathetic with those who want to turn. China into, into um, you know, a capitalist or a neoliberal economy. And so I'm really interested in, in uh, the class struggle that's going on in China now and the, the struggles, you know, some of his struggles within elites too. And um, I'm hoping that um, it will go in a more progressive and a more revolutionary direction. And we just don't know exactly it's in, indeterminate uh, but there are there are reasons there are a lot of reasons today for for um hope and um so i um i guess my my position on this is very similar to that of samir amin who uh, wrote quite a bit about it and uh, really influenced uh, month reviews view on china and it's very um very um similar to to um the view of um, many of the movements in the global south. Um, so there, there is hope there, but there's no certainty. There is conflict, um, and um, I'm I'm really hoping that uh, the uh, socialist forces will become more and more prominent in that society. Um, so um, I'm not really inclined to to um, 
brand societies. Um, the, um, their, uh, uh, I don't think that was Marx's method entirely either. I mean, he, he saw, he looked for the, the revolutionary uh, possibilities in given societies in indeterminate situations. And I think that that's what we, we have to do in this case. John, but let me ask you, that's uh, interesting. And, you know, I share the things that you said about uh, <clears throat> socialist left in China that of course we support, but how can we combine these things that we just mentioned about the centrality of ecology in the socialist project for the 21st century, you know, the value of political freedom for socialism in light also of the big defeat that we had in the 20th century, with some of the main limitation that China is showing us in the, the most recent years. What would be your opinion on this, if I, if I may continue the discussion just for one more minute, because we are close to the end. Well, I think that in terms of the environment, the, um, China has a sort of a, a, a socialist ecological modernization strategy that it's calling ecolo you know, ecological civilization, trying to build an ecological civilization. And it is a fact um, that they are doing more in response to the environment than any other uh, country in the world. That's, they're coming from a very low point, right? They're the biggest polluter, but they're doing, they're doing more, way more to shift things than any other country in the world. And that's just, um, we have lots of evidence in that. They're the, the leaders in all the alternative energy. They're, they're the leader in reforestation. They're getting their pollution down. They're doing a lot of things. The, the main problem is the coal burning. They've got to get rid of that um, and the coal fired plants. Um, they're moving away from it, but not fast enough. And uh, so this is, um, but at least they have ecological civilization as a project. Does the West have ecological civilization as a project? I don't think so. In terms of per political freedom, uh, the, um, of course, we get a lot of different information from the West. I have different sources of information, but I think that there are a lot of um, signs that um, political freedom are, is uh, better at least from a class standpoint in the G period than it was prior to that. For example, I think that their, their movements against the privatization of education, their, their various, their movements against corruption and so on, the extraordinary, these things are really um, the shift towards raising wages. These things are, um, uh, you know, it's, and um, even I think in terms of, um, of their, um, their um, re, their return to the mass line is their version of, of, um, of um, increasing the democracy in the society. I'm not saying that I'm, a, you know, I'm a follower of what's, you know, that I, I adhere to uh, what um, the Chinese line or their, their society, but I do think that the, the changes that are occurring now are, um, a, way, a, a huge improvement and a turn to the left compared to uh, the preceding period. And um, whether they'll succeed, I don't know. And there are all sorts of contradictions and there's some, um, there's, um, um, it could fall apart, um, but I do think that um, the, the direction is better. Uh, than it was, uh, say, in 1989, and uh, the um, they they've moved back towards a more explicit avowal of socialism, and and they're also trying to create a, a global South alliance, which is one thing that that um, a lot of us have wanted to see. So I'm hopeful, but uncertain, skeptical, but still hopeful. I see no reason for me to declare that China is one thing or another, but I can, you know, I can look at what's happening and see certain trends and possibilities that I, I think that as, as uh, Marxists, we ought to um, defend. Um, so 
that's my view. I I don't yeah I don't think there there the, the propaganda is that the um, that um, there has been a, a drop in political freedom under Xi. I think that that's that's the Western view, and um, that's precisely because of of what they're going against. Is because um, it's because um, they're actually doing some of the things they ought to be doing. Does that make sense to? Yeah. Yes, but we cannot continue the debate. We avoided the debate on COVID. We will continue the debate on China or other forms of socialism next time. Thank you. Thanks to Kira, to Suren, to Michael. It was wonderful. And uh, let's celebrate once again the Marx revival and all the wonderful books that have been mentioned in this talk and also in the chat. Thanks to John Bellamy Foster. It was a pleasure. Thanks to Thank all you. of you. And we are meeting Kira also in two weeks once again, right? Yes, we have another event, May 21st. I'd like to pass this over to Michael, who would like to announce two important events. And then uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming today and bearing with us for the somewhat strange interruptions in the chat. And uh, I'd also like to say, um, I'd also like to say that, uh, you know, we couldn't have had this discussion without you all. Uh, Michael, if you'd like to mention. Excuse me. The very thing about the May 21st is our second part on this Marx Revival series. And it's rare that you will have an event with as many important speakers. Not that John and Marcello weren't great today, but we have Michael Lowy, Bob Jessup, uh, Michael Cracky, uh, uh, Heather Brown, and Peter Hudis coming to address five other sections of this book. And Marcello is going to moderate and it will be a wonderful event. And that weekend, we almost have what was would be like a mini socialist scholars conference that weekend, because that event on the 21st at one to three, which with as many people will probably go a little over, a part one of the Yale Working Group on Globalization and Culture presenting on the state form and forming states will be an hour after that event on the 21st. And then the very next day, they will do part two. And Alfie Bone, who some of you may know from the UK, on Sunday, the 22nd, is going to talk about the gamification of relationships and how capital is enclosing even many aspects of our sex lives and, and our intimacies, et cetera. That will be an incredible weekend opening up with the review and, and panel on, on uh, the Marx revival with, with Marcello's moderation. <laughs>